take the time as a church community tonight to tackle this topic of anxiety. And I'm going to turn your attention to Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. And a special event that you can all be a part of is on Sunday, the 24th of this month, the third Sunday of this month, we will be having a breakfast seminar where we discuss some practical steps on how to face mental illnesses and how as well to be mentally strong. So that's something for the entire family, and you can book. That starts at 10 a.m. The breakfast is free, and the entire seminar is free of charge. So we had Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. If you have a Bible with you, you will see these words are written in red on the screen there in white. But the reason why these words are written in red in your Bible is because these are the words of Jesus. I want you to understand this, that Jesus, in all his teachings in this three-year period, thought it extremely important to tackle the topic of anxiety. So just in case you're a Christian that is very traditional, you say, well, anxiety is a fiction of our imagination and it's not important for us to deal with this topic. I want you to know that Jesus only had a limited amount of sermons that he could preach in his three-year ministry and he chose to speak on a topic of anxiety. Not only did he speak on it, but Matthew chapter 6 is known as one of the greatest chapters for the teachings of Jesus because it is the Sermon on the Mount. And in this sermon where there are thousands of people gathered, he tackles the topic of anxiety. Here's what he says. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on it. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap, nor do they gather into bands, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? As the person next to you, are you not more valuable than the Kobos? Are you not? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, the richest king of Israel, who was in an economic boomer during the land of Israel through the management of the resources, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these lilies. Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek after. For your heavenly Father knows that you have all these needs. So therefore, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. This verse for me preaches on its own. I feel like I could close the Bible right here. We could go into prayer. This is powerful. These are the words of Jesus. And I pray tonight that it speaks to your heart. Would you take your right hand, find your left heart tonight and see if it's beating. And let's go to God and pray. Heavenly Father, God, I've heard this verse before. I've heard this passage before. But tonight, God, let it really convict my heart. Let it penetrate the hardness of my heart and bring about the change that is needed so that I will not be suffering any longer from anxiety, but I will be set free through your word, Jesus. So Holy Spirit, work on my heart tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated tonight. Like last week's session, tonight we are going to take some time to teach around the subject of anxiety. So you are welcome to take notes as we go through tonight's teaching. If you don't have a physical book or pen to take notes on, you can use your cell phone device. My one request is that you put it on airplane mode so that you don't get any WhatsApp messages from your ex-girlfriend to distract you. We want to start tonight by defining anxiety. And the definition that I'm going to give you for anxiety, and this is a clinical definition, anxiety is a mental health condition 
that is characterized by excessive worrying about future threats which can lead to excessive fear. I'm going to repeat the definition again for you tonight, especially for those that are writing. Anxiety is a mental condition that is characterized by excessive worrying about future threats which leads to excessive fear. Now, if anxiety is heavily based in fear, we must also define this term fear. And for the context of this discussion, fear is the emotional response to real or perceived eminent threat. Fear is the emotional response to real or perceived eminent threat. Now, I want you to understand something. God has designed every one of us with the emotion of fear. Fear, as a matter of fact, is referenced in parts of the Bible in a relationship with God, that we should fear God. I want you to understand that we have been designed with a fight or flight mechanism within our body that when faced in a situation that is dangerous, our fear toxins are released to protect us from danger. So for example, if you're crossing the road and a car starts coming towards you, your fear levels increase, you start to feel that in your body and you pull away to protect yourself. And fear is a mechanism that is made up in you as a human being designed by God to protect you from the dangers that would exist. Fear in of itself is not evil. However, when we speak about anxiety, anxiety is highly dependent on us fearing about things that may never happen. So anxiety is based in that space of excessive fear of perceived threats. As a matter of fact, studies will show that 85% of the things that we worry about will never happen. Sometimes uh, that excessive fear might be worrying about if you would contract this certain disease or virus. That excessive fear might be around if something hazardous may happen to your children when you're not around. Or if when going to work, if you would get into an accident. It is overthinking and overanalyzing different types of situations. And it builds up fear and anxiety. But it is highly based on situations that may never occur. Now that we have an understanding of what anxiety is and what fear is, I want to then go into the space where we discuss several types of anxiety disorders. And this is so that you have a general understanding of this mental health illness that we are speaking about. Because when we speak about anxiety, there are different types of anxiety orders. And I'm going to go through seven of them with you tonight. Now, I'm not going to go in grave detail of all seven. We are going to spend most of our time tonight on generalized anxiety order, which is number seven. The first one that I have in this listing is separation anxiety disorder. Separation anxiety is more seen in children under the age of 12. And in most cases, children tend to grow out of separation anxiety or they may eventually allow the separation anxiety to develop into a panic disorder. So when children fear that their parents or their caregiver is no longer with them, that fear can develop into anxiety known as separation anxiety because they don't want to be separated from their parent. And if this type of anxiety is not dealt with and there is not progression over time, it may eventually lead into a young adult that has a panic disorder. So for example, a child that may suffer from separation anxiety but do not tackle that anxiety head on as a child, when they enter into adulthood, they may face panic attacks when placed in a high pressure situation where mommy and daddy is not around. So when they start working, if their boss exerts amount of pressure on them to fulfill tasks and duties within a certain amount of time because uh, they started off as a child with that separation anxiety and it was never dealt with. It developed now into a panic disorder where they feel that fear coming on because they're away from home, they're away from comfort, they're away from their parents uh, who over nurtured them and over protected them as a child. Most cases of separation anxiety is not hereditary, nor is it genetic, but it is from a place where parents over nurture their children. And I will talk a little bit more on this when we tackle how to be mentally strong and raising mentally strong kids in our next session. But what I do want you to understand is if you have a child that is going through separation anxiety, then you have to take small steps of being away from them so that they can gain independence and know that they will be okay without mommy or daddy in the room. So simple steps might be just leave them in a separate room to play. 
Simple steps. You don't have to be around them every moment. You don't have to hover over them every moment. Because when you do that, you create now this deep attachment where they feel as though if they are not seeing your shadow around them, they are fearful if something ill will happen to them. And in most cases with separation anxiety, the parents are the ones that need to introspect more than the children. Because this is something that is created by environmental factors. Number two is social anxiety disorder. And this may be caused from a situation where in a public setting, something humiliating may have happened. And then because of that, you have a great fear of social settings. So maybe you were made fun of in a group with a group of, of, of friends. Or maybe you were to talking in a public setting and you probably mispronunciated a word and everybody made fun of you. Or something more tragic happened, like you may have uh, tore your pants or something to that extent. And now it left you with this emotional scar where you're afraid of that social setting. The number three is specific phobias. So these are the people who cannot stand cockroaches. Now this is a very real fear, and I know some of the men are like, they, they're just like, come on, you all could kill the cockroach, they're so small. But it's a very real fear, especially when the cockroach could fly. It's a very real fear, and panic and, and, and the fear, um, fear levels do rise, and you do feel that tension and anxiety, that tension in your body. You do feel that jitteriness in your legs. You feel that because of that fear of that specific animal. Now, you may not be afraid of a snake, but you might be afraid of a cockroach, or vice versa, or you might be afraid of frogs, or you might be afraid of heights, or you might be afraid of certain types of spaces or things. That is known as a specific phobia. And again, in most cases, these are due to environmental factors. The environment that you grew up in probably caused you to be a, a little bit fearful of certain types of insects. You probably always expected that someone will kill the insect for you, and therefore you develop that fear where you didn't feel like you could tackle this one-on-one. On one. Now, with specific phobias, the recommendation is to try to slowly tackle those phobias. So, anybody have a problem with the cockroaches? Let me know. I'll gather some from home, <laughs> and we'll go one step at a time, right? But you have to slowly try to tackle it so that you overcome this fear. Number four is panic disorder, and panic disorder is often um, tied to panic attacks. Now, a panic attack is in an instantaneous moment, due to an increased level of anxiety and fear, you start getting a shortness of breath, and at times it can be very similar to a heart attack. So all the symptoms that you would experience during a heart attack where there's a pain in your chest, there's a tightening of your chest, there's a loss of breath, even leading to a loss of consciousness, happens during a panic attack. If in a panic attack, the best recommendation is to breathe into a bag, and through breathing into that bag, you actually are able to take in carbon um, dioxide into your brain, which actually helps uh, to reduce the panic that is happening and the, the airflow into your brain. So it's not oxygen that you need, but you actually need carbon dioxide. That's why you breathe into a bag, right? Don't go and sniff the muffler of the car. Breathe into the bag, right? But panic disorders are developed from different types of anxieties. And if someone has an underlying um, base level anxiety that is caused from a medical-induced anxiety, substance-induced, panic disorders can be instantaneously due to triggering factors such as overthinking in a scenario of what you're going to do next. Maybe you lost your job. Maybe you lost a relationship. And in that moment, you start overthinking, and the panic sets in, and a panic attack occurs. Number five is substance or medication-induced anxiety. And as the name would suggest, this is from the abuse of any form of substance, from alcohol to cocaine. And when we speak about medication, it's from any type of medication that has other side effects that you abuse, and it induces anxiety, high levels of um, jitteriness and fear factor within your body. Number six is anxiety due to medical condition. So you can have an underlying medical condition that can lead to anxiety or can cause you anxiety because there are chemical imbalances in your body. It raises certain chemical responses that leads to your metabolism speeding up, often linked with weight loss and therefore anxiety as well from an increased metabolism. So these six are for general knowledge. But number seven is what we're going to spend the most time on tonight, and this is generalized anxiety disorder. Generalized anxiety disorder. Now, this is the one that is most commonly seen in our society, and this is from those persons that overthink, that overworry excessively about certain situations and scenarios, and it leads now to anxiety. And 
To be classified as generalized anxiety disorder, if you meet three of the following six symptoms or signs that I'm about to give you, it is oftentimes classified by psychiatrists as general anxiety disorder. So these are the six. Number one is restlessness or being on edge. Number one is restlessness or being on edge. Number two is easily fatigued. So from doing a simple activity, you feel extremely tired. Number three is difficulty concentrating or mental blockage. So when it, you have to concentrate on a task or remember something, you find it very difficult, like if you're just going blank in your head and you cannot recall to memory what you're supposed to be doing. Number four is irritability, which could, link, could be <laughs> misdiagnosed as hunger, so just make sure you eat first, right? Irritability. Number five is muscle tension. This is oftentimes waking up with neck pains, back pains that is caused from that tension in your body due to anxiety. And number six is sleep disturbance. If you suffer from any three out of the six for a period of six weeks to six months, it is usually termed as generalized anxiety disorder. It must be for more days on than off during that six months period. And typically, generalized anxiety order is more seen in young adults around the age of 30. It can occur at any age. It is hardly seen in children. But at the age of 30, that is where life kicks in. You have bills to pay, mortgage, rent, wife, husband, child. And that's the time where typically generalized anxiety disorder tends to occur in young adults. Generalized anxiety disorder can lead to three main things. It can lead to substance abuse, emotional liability. As a matter of fact, in the U.S., 110 million persons per year take leave due to emotional instability. So they are unable to work because they are emotionally unwell. So generalized anxiety disorder can lead to emotional liability where you're not able to perform certain tasks and duties due to being emotionally unwell. And number three, it leads to performance decline. So in teenagers, it may lead to them because they are anxious about exams. It may lead to them not actually performing well because they are so overthinking the exam that they're about to write and what could happen and what, what their mother and father could do if they fail and who could do what to them, et cetera, and who could laugh at them, et cetera. And because of that now, it creates anxiety and it actually decreases performance. In young adults in the workplace, you may see someone performing really well and then they may start decreasing in their performance again because of generalized anxiety disorder, where because they are so fearful of the duties that they're supposed to do or because of personal issues, they tend to decline in their performance. I've given you a good understanding of what different types of general anxiety disorder brings about and what are the therefore causes of it. For the rest of tonight's teaching, we want to now discuss solutions to generalize anxiety. And the solutions that we started off in our discussion tonight with comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. So for the rest of tonight's teaching, what we're going to do is we're going to go through Matthew chapter 6, 25 to 34, verse by verse, to find out what are the solutions that are given by Jesus to tackle anxiety. Now what I want you to know is that you can be perfectly fine you could never have ever suffered from anxiety in your entire life. And then certain circumstances that you are placed in may cause you to feel extremely anxious. Certain circumstances may bring about that extremity of fear in your mind, and it may lead to anxiety. So as we go into this discussion of solutions, it might be applicable to you right now. It might be applicable in the future. It might be applicable for someone that you know and care about. So take notes, pay attention, and let God's word bring those solutions tonight for this aspect of anxiety. So we're going to start off in verse 25. It says, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body, what you will put on it. And here in this first introductory verse, Jesus gives us three types of major fears that we fight with. Because remember, anxiety is rooted in fear. And three major fears that Jesus gives us right off the bat, and we're going to actually discuss them one by one. Number one, he tells us about the first fear. The first fear is the fear of debt or injury. The fear of debt or injury. Anybody afraid of heights? Yeah? I have a fear of heights. I have a legitimate fear of heights. 
Now, my dad never understood this, and he would always laugh at me when I can't climb a ladder. But I have an actual fear of heights. When I stand on the edge of any high structure, so I can climb, as a matter of fact, I love to go to Rio Seco waterfall. And every time I go, along with the brave men, I would climb the waterfall. And I would climb to the top of the waterfall, which is about a 15 feet height. When I get to the top of the waterfall, which is a very hard climb because you have to climb through where the water is pounding down. You have to hold on to some random ropes that some stranger tied there before you and hope that they tied it well. You have to put your foot through the rocks and grip on with your hands. When, you do reach the, when I do reach to the top, every single time, now I want you to know something, every single time I was climbing. And every single time when I reach to the top, everybody else who's there with me would jump off. And then I would get to the edge, because I would be like, yeah, let go, I lie, man, I'm watching the trees, the birds are chirping, the, the water is, <laughs> is moving slowly. And then when it's my turn and I get to the edge and I stand on the edge, I feel my legs getting extremely weak, and all these thoughts start flooding my mind. So I start thinking, what if I hit that rock? <laughs> what if I go to jump and then I slip and I fall and then I slide off the edge? What if when I jump into the water, there's some type of big fish that bite me, <laughs> right? No, like, these thoughts are running through my, racing through my mind. My, weak, my legs are weak. I'm looking down, and the thought of injury or death is what comes flooding into my mind. I know there's, inten there's tenseness and fear that rises, and I actually cannot actually jump. I would stand there, and if I try to move my legs to jump, I can't. And every single time, I would just walk back and I would chill out for a little bit longer. There was one time I went with a group, I think it was a church group, or it could have been a friend group outside of church, and everybody jumped. I alone was left on top. As a matter of fact, other people from other groups came up, climbed up, jumped, and went back down. And I was, alone was left on top. Now, the thing about Rio Seco Waterfall is there's only one way down jumping, right? There's no walking back down. So that was the only, that's the only way back down. Now, granted, I know that I have a fear of ice, and I know that I would have a hard time jumping back down, but I still do it. I still climb up. That time that I went, I remember everybody got fed up. They were chanting for me. They were clapping. They were singing songs, trying to cheer me on and encourage me from the bottom. Some of them came up and tried to get, help me to go back to jump off and jumped off and got fed up. An hour passed. And everybody said, all right, we're going home. We, we can't wait any longer. And they start swimming off. And one by one, they start leaving to rack up and change their clothes. And eventually, I just mustered up the courage. I just focused on just running alone. And I just ran off and jumped off. Now, this has happened to me more than six times. <laughs> I've done this at Rio Seco. I've done this at Tree Pools. As a matter of fact, at Tree Pools, you can walk back down. That, and that's a 20-foot jump. But here's the thing. Even though I feel that fear and I know I have that fear, I still face it and take the jump. And in the moment that I'm jumping, I try to mess, get my mind as clear as possible and think about nothing. Because it's the thoughts or the fear of death that brings that fear on. And the fear of death or injury is a very real fear that we all face. For some of you, it might be like me, just a fear of heights, which you can avoid. But for some, it might be a fear of sickness. Where you're so afraid of getting sick or getting injured, that from the time you start a sniffle, you run by the doctor. Or you close up and you stay home. You call in and you sign in a sick leave, or you don't come to church. Because you have such a great fear of getting sick. Maybe it was due to someone that you love that would have passed away from illness, and now it's left you with that fear of sickness or injury. Some of you are so afraid of taking risks when it comes to physical activity because you're afraid of injury. And this fear of death or injury holds us back from enjoying some of the beauties of life. Because when I jump and hit the water, it is one of the greatest feelings that I can feel. Because I have accomplished a, a task, and I feel that I've succeeded at what I've set out to do. And the moment of enjoying that jump into that water is something that I cannot experience anywhere else. The fear of death and anxiety, for some of you, is holding you back from some of the greatest experiences that God has for your life. Some of you, you probably have not even left home 
to journey or travel or to take a job that is a distance away because you are so fearful of injury. Here's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21. And this for me is what comforts my heart for that fear of death and anxiety. He says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. To live is Christ and to die is gain. You see, Christ has offered every single one of us that by accepting and believing in him, that death no longer has control over us. That after this life, that we will enter into eternity with God. And the Bible even says that death no longer has power over us. And when this verse truly becomes real to you, that is a moment that you really have given your entirety and life to God. Now, I'm not saying to be stupid and jump in front of a car. But what I am saying is that for the things that God has called you to do, that you have to start facing that fear and know that your life is in God's hands, that he is in control, that he will determine whether you live or die. And even if you die, you enjoy the benefits of eternity with God. Now, I know for most people, you hear that, and you still say, nah, I want to live. Let me be really honest with you guys. I've said this more than one times before. I am fully content with dying. I could die right now. Okay, I'm still living. <laughs> the reason is that I feel as though every single day, I've given my all to live purpose for God. I've used my time for God wisely. And I feel as though, yes, there might be more to accomplish, and if I get the opportunity to, I will go hard at it. But if God takes me now, I am content with entering into eternity. As a matter of fact, I am overjoyed with being in eternity with my Savior, leaving behind this world and walking into the beauty of eternity that God has prepared for me. And for every one of you, I don't know what you face right now, but if you suffer from that fear of injury or death, you have to put your focus on the promise of God. That death no longer has control over you, but your life is in Jesus. And he is the one that has control over your life. So Jesus himself says, do not worry about your life. Then he lists a second fear. He says, do not worry what you will eat or what you will drink. And fear number two is the fear of lack, the fear of lack, or the fear of no provision, or the fear of no finances. Here's what Jesus says concerning this fear of lack. He says, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? I want you to understand something. Your provision for all your human needs as a follower of Christ is from God and not a person. It is not from your job. It is not from your clients. It is from God himself. The analogy that Jesus draws is that nature itself survives and lives all on the basis of God providing for nature. The lilies of the field, the birds of the air, they don't store up in their bank account. They don't save for tomorrow. They live by their daily bread. And they are dependent on their heavenly father providing all their needs. And because of that, they do not feel anxious or they do not face that fear of lack. Hmm. And the problem with the fear of lack is it causes two major things. It causes us to, number one, overwork. And number two, it causes us to overspend. So let me help you a little bit. If you fight with that fear of lack, then you might be doing either two of the other. You might be overworking yourself because you believe only if I give my hardest, I work really hard, clock a lot of hours, and make X amount of money, then my needs will provide, be provided. Or number two, you might overspend. 
because you don't ever want to be lacking. You buy all the clothes. Your closet has clothes that, you can't, that you've never worn before. Your, ward, your, your cupboards in your home is well stocked with all different varieties of foods, some things that you're probably even allergic to. Because, because you have this fear of lack, you end up overspending. And this fear of lack is one of the things that even among Christians, I find to be extremely prevalent. This fear of lack tends to control our lives. And it makes us make decisions that pull us away from God. And the underlying basis is this. My son, he will get up in the morning and he will not ask if we made groceries. He will not ask how much money we have in our bank accounts. He will not ask if we have money to send him to school. He will wake up in the morning and he will just do what he's supposed to do because he has a trust that his parents will provide what is needed. This is a childlike faith that we all need to have if we want to overcome that fear of lack, where we understand that we are sons and daughters of the king, that he owns the earth and everything in it. And if he owns all of it and he is our heavenly father, then certainly he will provide for all our needs. He is faithful and just. He will not leave us begging, but he will provide. You don't have to store up in barn houses. There's an analogy that Jesus gives of a rich man who gets a great increase from his crops. He takes all of it and he stores it into bands. And he says, for the rest of my life, I will do nothing because now I have everything that I need. And in that very night, he dies. And the parable goes on to say, O oh, ye fool, you stored up and hoarded for yourself and you were not able to use it. I'm not telling you to not be financially prudent. As a matter of fact, in November, we will discuss financial management. But what I am saying is that if you are storing up from that place of fear, that place of lack, if you are overworking because you have not reached to that space where you can trust God to provide for the things that you are not able to work off your time to do, then you are at a very dangerous place. Because overworking and overspending fuels that fear that fuels anxiety. And you will have higher stress levels. You will not be able to sleep well at night. Every day when you wake up, every part of your body will hurt and you have to take a tablet and go to work with all that pain in your body. You know why your body pain in you? Because you're stressed. Not because you're working hard. You're sitting down behind a desk all day. But because you are so stressed out, because you are anxious and worrying about how things will work out, and you are not trusting God in that area. And to be a child of God, you have to fully trust your heavenly Father and say, God, if you can care for everything that you created, how much more valuable am I? How much more valuable are you? Do you understand that you are the peak of God's creation on this earth? That biologically, you are the prime creation on this earth right now? And if you were created by God with such great value and more importance than other animals that exist, and he cares for all of them, why are you worried? Will he not care for you? So there's the fear of death or injury, the fear of lack. Number three is the fear of missing out. So here's what he says. Jesus says, know your body with what you will put on it. Is not life more than food and your body more than clothing? Who bought the iPhone 16? Let me see earlier. I have an iPhone 11. I don't even think there's make that anymore. The fear of missing out. Makes you buy clothes, makes you buy stuff, makes you go places, be around people that you don't even like. 
because you don't want to miss out. You don't want to be left out. You want to fit in. You want to be in all the trends. And because of that fear of missing out, you actually take your focus off of the things in life that are important. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, is not life more than clothes and food? Is there something not more important in life than the stuff that you have? Isn't there things that are more valuable than these things? As a matter of fact, recent studies in the U.S. indicate that your income relative to your peers rather than your relative income is an increased risk factor for anxiety and depression. What does that mean? It means that when you compare yourself to the people around you, the fear of missing out, it increases your risk of anxiety and depression. So that study showed that it didn't matter if you were in the middle class or lower class in the economy and someone else was in the upper class, that because you're in a different status in your, in your finances, that because of that, it led to more anxiety. Here's what it showed instead. It showed that you can have all the money, be in the upper class, and have money that you can just throw around. And because somebody else bought a yacht, and you didn't buy one, that fear of missing out can lead to higher risk of anxiety and depression. Comparison. Comparison exacerbates anxiety. And we live in a culture where all we do is compare. Every time you scroll, you are comparing yourself, your family, and the stuff you have to someone else. And that comparison culture has been so deeply rooted in us that you can wake up in the morning happy and then see a TikTok about how um, a somebody, somebody husband make them a cup of coffee and an omelet and brought it to them in their bed. And now you sad. Your husband didn't bring you a cup of coffee and make you an omelet. And here's what. That was probably a stage video. They probably went to Starbucks, buy that, come back home, and then lie down back in their bed. Because it ain't real half the time, 99% of the time, as a matter of fact. Only Instagram couples don't last too long. And you start comparing yourself. Somebody go on a vacation and you have to work all year. You start comparing yourself. And you lose contentment because of that comparison culture. You lose focus on the things that are important in life because you start focusing on what somebody else has. And you start focusing on the stuff more than the one that provides all your needs. More than the one that cares for you. More than the one that has called you. And you have to stop comparing. Now, I'm 31 this year. When my dad was 31, he had already finished majority of our home that I still live in. And he had already moved in with my mom and myself. I was about a year old. Now, the house wasn't well finished. It wasn't painted. It didn't have a front gate. But um, it had some mother-in-law and daughter-in-law issues, so he had to move fast into the house. <laughs> right? Bless my mother, my grandmother who died. <laughs> Okay, we don't do the, we don't do the cross. Um, but yeah, so they would have moved in very quickly. Toilets wasn't finished, etc. And they kind of got things finished along the way over a long period of time. But here's the thing. At 31, he was able to move into a home. Me at 31, I'm not able to afford a home. Now, I can quickly start comparing myself to my colleagues that I went to university with that are the same age as me and have one home and probably buying a second right now that have land and starting other things at the same time. I could even compare myself to other people and family members that probably have their own home as well. And that comparison can steal my contentment and cause me anxiety. But instead of comparing myself to where someone else is in life, I compare myself to who God has called me to be. And the reason that I'm here right now today is because I've chosen to be obedient to God because life is more than the stuff. So I might never own a home, and I'm content with that because I'm following God's call for my life. And I don't need to compare myself to what someone else has and what someone else is doing. I need to focus on what God has called me to do, his plan for my life, his purpose for my life. And I don't face that fear of missing out, but I'm content with what Jesus has for me. Because life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Jesus continues to say 
in verse 30, how much more will your heavenly Father provide for you? And then he kind of closes off verse 30 with saying, O oh, you of little faith. O oh, you of little faith. Now we started off by saying anxiety draws its power in fear. And we see a very important principle that is introduced here by Jesus. He introduces this principle of faith. Now fear is that space where we are overthinking about possible imminent threats, and that increases now our fear of what may happen. So imminent threats as missing out, uh, of debt, of lack, uh, those imminent threats causes fear. But Jesus introduces faith. And I have a little definition for fear that we're going to use right now in this discussion, and that is F-E-A-R. It is false evidence appearing real. When we speak about fear for the instance of anxiety, it is that sense of overthinking about things that may never happen. So it's false evidence appearing real. And the definition of faith that is given in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 is that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now I want you to see something. Fear and faith in this context is very opposite to each other. Fear is negative. It is false evidence appearing real. Faith, however, is positive. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So it is you believing in something that you have not seen as yet. Fear is the opposite. Fear is believing in something that is negative, that appears to be real to you. Faith, however, is believing in something that you have not seen as yet because you believe in God who will make it a reality. The reason I want you to understand the opposite between these two is because Jesus now introduces that in order to overcome anxiety and worry, you must have faith. In order to overcome anxiety and worry, you must have faith. I have a battery in my pocket. You all can see this battery? Anybody can, you all can see this battery? Yeah, it's a very small battery. But you can see the battery, right? Now, I want you to think about fear as the negative side of the battery. And I want you to think about faith as the positive side of the battery. Fear is the negative side of the battery. Faith is the positive side of the battery. Now, for this battery to work, I have to plug in both the negative side and the positive side for it to give power. I want you to understand something very important about your faith. Faith is not the absence of fear, but it's the ability to face fear and still be purposeful. So you can have fears, and you can still stand at the edge of that cliff, and you can dive into faith and jump into what God is calling you to do. You can be fearful of lack. You could be fearful of missing out. You could be fearful of debt. But even in the midst of that fear, you can still have faith to say, I trust in God in spite of the fear that I face. And the goal in this discussion is not to remove your fear, but to say, in spite of that fear, I have faith in God. I have faith in the creator of this universe that holds the world in place, that created me and formed me and holds my life in his hands. I have faith in God. And Jesus says, oh, you of little faith. Now, here's where it's going to get a little bit aggressive. He says, therefore, do not worry, saying, what we shall eat, nor what we shall drink, or what we shall wear. For after these things, the Gentiles seek. Now, I'm only going to speak to the Christians in the house. If you're here for the first time, you're deciding on whether you believe in Jesus or not, I'm not speaking to you right now. I'm speaking to those who've decided to follow Christ and they claim to, to believe that Jesus is their Lord and they claim they are serving God. Here's what I want you to understand. I want you to understand something. Jesus says that worrying over your life, over your food, over missing out, that these are the things that the Gentiles do. Who are the Gentiles? Gentiles are those that do not believe in God.
And this is going to sound really offensive. But if you are a follower of Christ, you should not be worrying about these things. I'm sorry if I have to offend you right now. But offense is the first step to change. He says the Gentiles, those who do not believe in God, they worry about these things. And you can write this down tonight. Worry steals worship from God and gives it to anxiety. Every time you worry about food, about clothes, about your life, you are stealing worship that you're supposed to be giving to God and you're giving it to anxiety instead. You are stealing a thought and a moment where you're supposed to be saying, thank God that you will provide all my needs. Thank God that you will protect me and keep me. Thank God that you have given me purpose. Every moment that you worry, you steal worship from God and you give it to anxiety instead. I want you to understand this, Christians. You are taking worship from God and giving it to anxiety. And Jesus blatantly says in this text that it is the Gentiles that worry over these things. Those who do not know God. But if you know God, you should not indulge yourself in worrying about tomorrow because your God will care for all your needs. That is a part of saying that I am a follower of Christ that I have faith in God, that he is my heavenly father. The both of them cannot be separated. You cannot say you trust God, but then you fear for your life. And I'm not saying that it will not be a battle to get there. But what I am saying is that if you are choosing to follow God, you are also choosing to give up on the fear of anxiety and say I will have faith in my heavenly father. And in spite of, in spite of fear, I will follow God. So when you write this down, a Christian should not worry about their life, about lack, or about missing out. I don't want to be harsh. I really don't. But this is what Jesus is saying in this passage. I want to be truthful and honest with you. I don't want to baby you up and indulge anxiety and fear that you should be handing over to God and saying, I trust you instead, God. A Christian should not worry about his life, lack, or missing out. Instead, here's what it says. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. What does it say to do? A very practical step, right? It's a very practical step. He actually tells you what to do. He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. So write this down. A Christian that does not prioritize the kingdom will be controlled by anxiety. Let me repeat that. A Christian that does not prioritize the kingdom will be controlled by anxiety. What is the shift that Jesus makes? Don't worry about these things. But instead, here's what you should do. You should seek first his kingdom. That should be your number one priority. That you seek first his kingdom, his will, the way that he wants you to lead your family, the way that he wants you to raise your kids, the way that he wants you to serve others in your community, the way that he wants you to serve people in your workplace, the way that he wants you to serve in the body of Christ. This is what should be your priority instead of worrying. And you might know, or you might even be in that place where you are facing worry continuously as a child of God. Here's what you need to do, a very practical step. Start prioritizing the kingdom of God. Here's how Jesus even concludes this passage, right? He says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own troubles. And I remember at home when we were reading, when this verse was read out loud, Jessica said, well, that, that isn't very good news ending of the passage. Don't worry about tomorrow because sufficient are the troubles that you have to face today. Today is already bad enough. Why are you stressing over tomorrow? 
And there's a practical step, right? The practical step is prioritizing the kingdom of God. When you start prioritizing the kingdom of God, you don't have time to worry. At the end of the night, I, don't have not, I sleep like a baby. Because you know why? I'm mentally burnt out. <laughs> don't call me and I got my brain and functioning anymore. Because I was doing the things of God all day. So by the end of the night, my mind don't have the ability to worry about all different things. If you find yourself worrying at night, it's because you have not been prioritizing the kingdom during the day. So your mind is preoccupied with all the negative thoughts and all the negative outcomes because you have not been using your mind. You, you have a brilliant mind. You're not any bit smarter than anybody else. There's no a medical cause that your mind is accelerated and now it's causing you to overthink. No, you just don't have the good things to think about. You're just not putting your focus on actually doing the work of God. And for the time you make that shift from worrying onto doing the work of God, you will shift from being controlled by anxiety to being set free from anxiety. Because sufficient for the day is its own troubles. I already have enough to think about, enough things to plan around, enough things to work out throughout my day that I don't have to worry about tomorrow. But instead, I can trust God who holds tomorrow. Because the one thing I don't have control over is tomorrow. I have control over the decisions I make right now, but I don't have control over tomorrow. And from the time I say, God, you deal with tomorrow and I will deal with today, anxiety no longer has control. And as I close off tonight, I want you to understand something. Jesus not only speaks about anxiety, but Jesus himself faces anxiety. That might seem like blasphemy to somebody in this space, but even Jesus faced anxiety. And I'm going to show you it. Luke chapter, just give me a second when I find it. Luke chapter 22. And verse 39. It says, Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives, as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. And when he came to that place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone true. And he knelt down and he prayed. This is a night that he would be arrested before facing trial and then being murdered. And he prayed and he said, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven and strengthened him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Luke, writing in this passage, describes a medical condition that is very rare. It's called hematrodosis. And it occurs oftentimes with soldiers just before going out to battle, where they will be so anxious and fearful about the battle that they are about to face, that the blood capillaries in their sweat glands will burst and will cause them to sweat blood. His sweat became like blood dropping and falling to the ground. As Jesus knelt in agony in prayer about the battle that he was about to face for your life, the fear and anxiety 
of the very real threat, not a false threat, not a possibility, but the very real threat of being mocked, of being beaten with 39 stripes, of being agonizingly pushed up a hill carrying a cross to be nailed through his hands and through his feet. The fear of the battle that he would face caused him great anxiety that he sweat like this. And a younger me, when preaching this passage, would have said something like, well, Jesus sweat blood for you, so you don't have to sweat over it. But as I've matured, yes, you can cast your cares on Jesus. But like Jesus, if you are going to be anxious about anything, let it be the battle that you are fighting for the kingdom of God. If you're going to kneel down in prayer and agony, sweating, let it not be over what you will eat, what you will drink, or what you will wear, but let it be for the souls that are dying to a Christless eternity. Jesus was in great pain and agony because he was about to lay down his life for you. You now can have that free gift of salvation because he faced his fear. He faced the pain because while he was all God, he was all man. And none of us could lay down at night tonight knowing that tomorrow we will be stoned, we will be beaten, we will be crucified, and we would not be anxious. But Jesus faced that anxiety for you. And here's my call. The shift that Jesus makes in this passage in Matthew chapter 6 is do not worry, but instead put your focus on the kingdom of God. Put your focus on prioritizing and seeking first his kingdom. For the Christians in the house, this is my challenge for you right now. Don't let your days go wasted, but start using the gift of time, Start using the gift of your mental abilities and your physical strength to serve in his kingdom, to do that which he's called you to do. And if you're struggling with anxiety, that will quickly fade away when you start prioritizing the kingdom of God. As a pastor, I face anxiety. And even though I may go through those moments where I face those thoughts of fear, of what if and how this will turn out. I face that anxiety for the kingdom of God so that souls can be drawn in. It is not over the things in life that will pass away, but over the things that are eternal. I want you to see the transition that happened. I'm not guaranteeing you that you will not face anxiety, but what I am saying is when you face those fears, it will be for a greater purpose. It will be for a greater purpose than what you will eat or what you will drink. And instead, it will be for the purpose of building the kingdom of God. And if you want to move from anxiety to faith, it starts with seeking first his kingdom. This is a recommendation of Jesus. And this is a recommendation that I'm sharing with you tonight. Start serving in his kingdom. So I want to invite you to stand tonight. I would just ask if you would close your eyes in this moment and just set your heart on God. Every fear that you face right now, I want you to know that God is here in this moment to comfort you, to strengthen you, and to build up your faith right now that you can face those fears. If you're here for the first time, 
maybe you were a follower of Christ, but you strayed away. Or maybe this is the first time ever being in a church tonight. I want you to know that Jesus cares about you. I want you to know that you are valuable to God. I want you to know that you are so valuable that Jesus died for you. He went through great pain and agony and suffering and fear and anxiety for you so that you can have life in him, so that you can have eternity with him, that you will no longer fear death, that you will no longer fear lack, that you will no longer fear missing out, but you will find great purpose in Jesus Christ. You will find purpose to wake you up in the morning. You will find purpose to keep you active throughout the day. You will find purpose to give you your thoughts too. And tonight if you're in that place where you're saying you want to have this life in Jesus, you don't want to be controlled by anxiety anymore, but you want to be set free by putting your faith in God and saying, God, you are in control. I trust in you. You are my heavenly father and you will care for all my needs. If tonight you're in that space and you want to put your life into God's hands, I'm going to lead you in prayer. And as you would pray with me, your heavenly father will care for you. Your life will belong to Jesus. He will protect you. He will shield you and he will provide for you. So with your eyes closed around this house, if right now you're saying, yes, Jesus I want you to be my God. I want you to be my heavenly father that cares for me and provides for me that I will not struggle under anxiety any longer. If you're saying yes, I'm going to lead you in prayer right now. And as you pray, God will hear and he will answer. Let us pray tonight. Heavenly Father, I believe tonight that Jesus is the son of God, that he came to this earth And he died for me. But he's not in the grave. Because three days later he rose from the grave. And he is alive. And he has given me new life in him. Right now God, I commit my life into your hands. I commit my life now into your hands. And I ask Jesus to come into my life. And to be Lord and Savior of my life. I commit from this day forward to serve Jesus. Forgive me, God, of my sins and make me now a new person in Jesus that I can live a full life, that I can live a purposeful life, that I would be no longer worried and anxious, but, God, I will have faith that my God, the creator of this universe, will provide, will care, will protect And will meet all my needs. So I thank you now Jesus. For hearing this prayer. I thank you God that you've called me a son. You've called me a daughter. And just as a child will trust their parents to care for them. I can trust you God to care about my tomorrow. Because my life is in your hands. And you are in control. Tonight if you're a follower of Christ. Or even you've said this prayer. And you've not been prioritizing the kingdom of God. And you want to make that commitment tonight to prioritize the kingdom of God. To seek first the things of God. To seek first the way that God wants you according to his word to lead your home. To serve in the workplace. To serve in the community. To serve in the church. If tonight you want to prioritize his kingdom and serving in his kingdom. Then I'm going to lead you in prayer tonight. And as you make that commitment, God is going to guide you. He's going to lead you. And all that is required is obedience to his voice. To prioritize what he's called you to do so that you can live a purposeful life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, tonight God, we commit. We commit God to serving you with all our heart, with all our might, and with all our soul, God. God, forgive us for where we've prioritized other things, God. Where we've prioritized overworking, overspending, where we've prioritized the fear of missing out and 
We prioritize, God, comparison to where other people are at, trying to chase after stuff. For God, life is more than the things, God. For these earthly treasures will pass away. But God, we want to lay up treasures in heaven that are eternal, where mud and rust cannot destroy, God. So God, right now, we pray that you will open our ears to hear your voice, that your word will speak to us and will instruct us on what you've called us to do, that we can prioritize the kingdom, God. We can prioritize your work, God, on this earth, in our families, in our communities, in our church, that as we prioritize the kingdom of God, we will not worry about the stuff, God, but all our needs shall be provided by our Heavenly Father. So God, we make that commitment tonight. I pray now that you will give us purpose, God. That when we wake up in the morning, our focus will be on the things you've called us to do. Not on the fear, not on the overthinking, not on the anxiety, but God, that you have called us. You've called us, God. And you have a plan for us, God. That you want us to serve our family and you want us to love one another and you want us to serve this in this kingdom. A great purpose that you've placed over our life. And let that purpose, God, lead us, God. Let that purpose, God, encourage us. Let that purpose, God, strengthen us. That even when we face anxiety, God, our faith will be stirred up as we put our faith in you. That in spite of the fear and anxiety, God, we will push on into the purpose and into prioritizing your kingdom. So that men and women, so that those that are lost, those that are hurting, those that are broken, those that are in pain right now can come to know Jesus Christ. So I thank you now, God, for hearing this prayer. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for filling our vessels now and empowering us, God, to do your work, God. I thank you now, God, for speaking to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to thank you for your attention tonight as we...